Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Megan. I'm your um, instructor for Art History 2. If you haven't yet, please um, make sure that you're following along in the Modules tab, which is also the home page for this class, and you will see that you have um, a couple of assignments that are up already. So you need to make a post in the Introductions discussion, Introducing Yourself. That is uh, worth points. And you also have an assignment in the discussion thread for uh, Renaissance and Baroque, um, which is under that module. And you have a quiz there. You don't have to do the quiz yet. It's not due until a week from Friday. Um, but go ahead and check that out. OK, so first topic. Um, let's talk about early Renaissance in Northern Europe. You have this slideshow, it's in the module, so you can also go back and look at it after you listen to the lecture. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe at this time. The Europe of then did not quite look like the Europe we know today. So um, first of all, we're in the 15th century, so the 1400s, right? So when this opens up, we have um, kind of a split between the major powers in Europe. So we have Rome and Avignon, which is in France, um, are still the official two different seats of two different popes. So at this time, the pope exerts a lot of power, so it's a little tricky because there's two of them. This happened because of the Great Schism, which um, was earlier. Basically, in uh, 1305, the um, cardinals elected a French pope who decided to move the papal seat to Avignon, which is in uh, southern France. You can see on the map here. Um, traditionally, the seat had been in Rome, in Italy, um, so this uh, becomes a thing for a while, and we have um, a response from Rome. Basically, the, the Pope um, in 1378 is Clement II, and he's in Avignon. He's the French Pope, essentially, and the uh, Romans don't like this, the Holy Roman Empire, so they decide that they're going to elect their own Pope. Um, Urban VI was his name, if you're curious. And so he mo he has his seat in Rome, and then we have the other pope in Avignon. This continues uh, for like 40 years. Eventually it's resolved. They have a whole council, and they decide to elect a new pope. Um, that's going to be the pope for the whole, all of Europe. Um, that's Martin V, if you care. So after that, there's no more major schism. Anyway, so at where we stand on this map, one of the reasons for the division is these, this two-pope situation because of the Great Schism. The other thing's going on at the beginning of the 15th century, so um, the Hundred Years War is still happening. That's a, a big war. It was from uh, 1337 to uh, 1453. So that is between France and England, as you might know. So that's, you know, causing a lot of um, conflict and things happening in Europe. Um, we also have, so there's a system called feudalism, um, which you may have, if you've studied medieval history at all, you know about feudalism. So that's on the decline, and instead of feudal, feudalism, we're starting to have um, the rise of uh, kind of nobility um, within each government. So like centralized royal governments, essentially, that work with the people, but it's not a feudal system. Because of the dissolution of feudalism, we also have a rise in the merchant class, which is fairly new. So that's like um, people who aren't nobility, but who are trading goods and banking and things like this. As that develops, we also see development in trade and related systems to trade. Um, so like credit and exchange becomes a thing, international banking becomes a thing, especially in international banking, our two big ones are uh, Jacques Coeur, who is um, in Bourges, and then we also have the Medici family, um, which is in uh, Florence in Italy, which you may have heard of the Medicis. They're quite famous. We're going to be talking about them a lot. They're big patrons. There's a Netflix series on the Medicis. I have not watched it myself, but it's supposed to be pretty good. So if, if you're into that, that exists. Um, okay, and so then we also have the Flemish uh, up in Flanders. They establish the um, first commercial stock exchange in Antwerp. So we have lots of people who aren't nobility who are making money and have the means to do things like buy art, which is why we care about this, right? Um, so because of all this prosperity, prosperity in Europe is going up, we have um, a greater exchange of goods across Europe, which also uh, means a greater exchange of ideas across Europe, which is pretty rad. So this, this all is good for art. This makes art thrive. 
Um, so we have different kinds of patrons. A patron is someone who buys art or commissions art to be made. So our different types of patrons, we have royal patrons, we have ducal patrons, we have church, the church's patron, and then we have, have these private patrons, which are like our, um, our merchant class and banker type people we were just talking about. Okay, the other things that are happening that make uh, this super interesting is we have new techniques that are being pioneered in the art world. Things like oil painting, things like printmaking. And then uh, Gutenberg, you may have heard of this guy, he's pretty important. He invents the printing press, which means that things can be produced more rapidly um, and dispersed uh, throughout Europe. So even more information can move around. So this uh, later leads into the interest in humanism. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, so these are the conditions of the things we're going to talk about. In each of our um, subsections, in our modules, I'll pick a few artworks, major artworks to talk about in these lectures, and then I'll assign some to you to, to research on your own in the discussion. And that's kind of how we build our repertoire of um, paintings and sculptures and things to discuss. Your quiz, uh, which you'll have one quiz in each module, the only things that will appear on the quiz are works that are in the slideshows that go with my lectures. Okay, so there's one quiz for this whole unit. This is just a subsection of the unit. Um, there'll be 10 artworks in that quiz. Okie dokie, let's look at some art. So uh, this is, um, these are some pages from an illuminated manuscript. If you've studied uh, Gothic and medieval art at all, you've heard a lot about illuminated manuscripts. What does illuminated manuscript mean? So mostly prior to this time period, these were books that were produced by um, monks, mostly. And so uh, they're scribes, they're writing um, usually holy books, and they are also illustrating them. So illuminated just means illustrated, basically. Okay? Okay, so let's talk about this particular thing. Um, so in 15th century Northern Europe, um, artists are kind of building on these achievements of the Gothic era um, illuminated manuscript manuscript painters. So we have new interest in fully modeled figures. What does modeled mean? Um, it doesn't mean like Christy Turlington modeling. Um, you guys are probably too young to know who Christy Turlington is. I don't know who the new models are. Um, one of the Kardashians? I don't know. That's not what it means. It doesn't matter. Modeling in art means um, using a value scale to make things look three-dimensional. So a lot of the artwork was very, very flat from the Middle Ages. And now that we're coming into the Renaissance, in these manuscripts um, at this time in the 15th century, we start seeing more of an interest in things like perspective and in things like value and showing that something isn't just flat, that there's depth and shape. So if you look at these images, you can see that there's a foreground, a background, um, and a, a middle ground, and that there's an attempt at perspective, okay? And that there's, there's not just a flat color, each color has um, tents and shades, which is um, kind of highlights and shadows, to show that things are three-dimensional, just being represented two-dimensionally. Okay, so that's a big thing in this time period. Um, the most, most innovative of these Illuminated man Manuscript makers at this time period are the Limburg brothers. The Limburg brothers are named Paul, Herman, and Jean. Uh, they're from the Netherlands. They're the nephews of Jean... Um, what is Jean's last name? Jean Malul, who is a um, court painter to Philip the Bold, who's an important uh, leader at the time. Anyway, so they're his nephews, so they're kind of like set up to be in the upper escalon of society already, right? They've already kind of got it, gotten in. Um, in 1402, they moved to Paris. When they're in Paris, they start working for a duke, uh, specifically the Duke of Berry. The Duke of Berry is a very powerful duke because his brother... Um, is King Charles V. So that's the King of France. So this is a very connected guy. So they're his main court artists, which puts them in a pretty good position. Um, at the time leading up to this, there are different kinds of um, manuscripts that are popular. One of the most popular ones is the Book of Hours. What's interesting about this is that it's kind of a secular book, meaning it's not religious. Most books at this time are the Gospels or prayer books. The Book of Hours has an intersection with religiosity, but it also is just portraying what people do at different times of the year, basically. So for this one, this was made for the Duke of Berry. Um, it's called Le Très Riche Ur, Du, du, de Berry, which means um, essentially the hours of the, the life, the times of uh, the Duke of Berry. 
So in this, it's set up by the 12 months. So each month has a page. Um, you'll notice at the top, there's a lunette, uh, that's what that is called, that has the zodiac signs um, for that would be prominent for the time of the month. So this one is January. So you can see Capricorn up there. I'm a Capricorn water goat. Um, okay, so these things uh, depict activities both on the nobility side and the peasant side. So it's super interesting. This particular one is kind of the rock star of this kind of text at the time. It's very famous, um, so they become quite well known. Um, and part of this is kind of has a propagandic property, meaning that it makes the Duke of Berry look really good. It makes him look like this very welcoming host who has all his peasants and people that he rules over into his home, and he's this kind of wonderful person. So part of it is he wants to be portrayed in a really good light, okay? Uh, so let's see, we have full page illustrations, represent the 12 months, um, they're associated with the season. Uh, I think we kind of covered all this. Okay, so um, what happens to the brothers Limburg? They die, they all die in the same year. They die in 1416. Um, because they all died at the same time, they probably died of the plague. A lot of people did. So RIP brothers Limburg, sorry the plague gotcha. Okay, let's look at something else. So. Uh, let's talk about what people are making art with at this time. Today, uh, a lot of painters, I'm a painter, um, use acrylic paint um, or oil paint or watercolor. Those are kind of the big ones. Um, at this, in this time period, the main um, paint being used is egg tempera. Uh, egg tempera was a material that's made from taking, um, you grind up pigment, usually made from um, gemstones or other precious materials, and you mix it into a paste, and then you mix that with egg yolk. And then to paint with it, it's very annoying to paint with, in my opinion, uh, you paint these little kind of uh, short brush stroke, thin layers of paint. And it creates this really rich, lovely color. It dries very quickly though, so you kind of only get one layer. You get like one go at it. Um, so, uh, if you, and if you, made it th if you make it thicker, it cracks and breaks off like the egg binder doesn't work if you try to paint too thickly with it. Okay so oil paint which is pigment mixed with um, oil with linseed oil particularly if you're interested. Um, so it's been used as early as the 8th century but it doesn't become really popularized until this time. So um, in the 1400s is what I mean what we're talking about now. This is when it kind of becomes the main medium used by painters. Um, Okay, so Robert uh, Campen is who we're talking about first. He's one of the first um, major artists to use oil pigment and to kind of popularize its use. So for a long time, we didn't know who Robert Campen was. By we, I mean various art historians and people who are interested in art. Um, he was just called the Master of Flamel, um, but he's later identified the the master of Flamel was Robert Campen, so we know who he is. Uh, so this discovery of better painting techniques improved the qualities of the painting. So unlike tempera paint, when you do oil painting, you apply layers of paint. It, oil paint takes a very long time to dry, so this is called glazing. So you apply glazes of paint and it allows you to build up these really rich um, depth, deep colors with um, nuances and subtlety of color underneath. So it, it creates um, kind of a, it's, it's kind of a game changer in terms of painting. So that's why it's important. Um, okay, also you don't have to carry eggs around with you, which is nice. Uh, so artists lay down these colors and transparent glazes, which they layer. Um, and so it's with oil that we see some later developments in Italy as well. You may have heard of Leonardo da Vinci. He's pretty popular. He has a Ninja Turtle named after him. Um, we're going to talk about him later. But he invents a technique called sfumato, uh, S-F-U-M-A-T-O. And it means smoky. It's the Italian word for smoky. That technique is very important in the Renaissance, and it would not have been possible without oil paint. So... Also, impasto brush techniques, which is a very heavy, thick brush technique, not possible with tempera, only possible with oil. Though today you can do it with acrylic. Anyway, okay, so let's get back to this guy. So, um, they can be used on a variety of surfaces, tempera and oil. So later people get really into um, linen canvas becomes the primary thing. At this time it's still wood panel, 
Um, and the kind of wood, uh, if you're a person who's interested in that, varies kind of on where you are and what's available. Italian painters all used poplar. The northern painters that we're talking about now used all kinds of stuff. Oak, beech, chestnut, kind of whatever you had around. It doesn't really matter. It's just what's around you. Okay, so the Master Flamel was one of the greatest Flemish painters um, of his time. Art historians now pretty much agree that this was Robert Campin. Uh, sorry if you hear noises in the background. That is uh, the kids playing Star Wars Battlefront. Apologies. Okay, uh, so this is his most famous work, the one we're looking at now, the Moro Triptych. Um, it was produced for a private patron. It was intended for household prayer. So this is a little different. Up until this time, most works, um, other than small icons in the Byzantine Empire, were produced um, for churches. So if you have a triptych like this, it would be up on the altar in a church. This is quite small if you look at the dimensions. Um, it's about two feet by two feet in the middle. Um, so this becomes a new thing. Patrons want their own devotional um, pieces for their household for prayer. So let's take a peek at this. The um, integration of religious and secular concerns is a big thing that happens in Northern Renaissance painting at this time. Um, the subject of this is the Annunciation, which if you've studied any painting um, from the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, this is very popular. If you haven't, that's why we're here. Um, the Annunciation is discussed, um, it's prophesized in Isaiah 7.14. Um, and basically the idea is that um, the Archangel Gabriel, who is uh, wearing the, the white kind of dress there and has the wings, comes and tells Mary, the Virgin Mary, that she is going to be the mother of God. Okay, so that's, if you see something called the Annunciation, that is the story that's being told. Um, okay, so in this um, painting, oftentimes there's some kind of thing showing that, that this is going to happen to her, that, that um, kind of alludes to what's happening. So if you look in the corner above, um, in the center panel above Gabriel's head toward the little window, you see a little teeny tiny cross with Christ on it uh, that's being brought in on a ray of light that's sort of angled towards Mary. So that is your indication that this is um, God coming into the scene and that she is going to give birth to the Christ. Okay, so uh, in all of these Annunciation stories, you, the important ingredients are the Archangel Gabriel, the Virgin Mary, Usually it's in a domestic setting, oftentimes it's in a garden of some kind, uh, and there's usually either a dove or a ray of light or some kind of Holy Spirit-esque kind of thing going on, like the little cross that you see up in the corner there. Um, she's in, this one is interesting, she's in a typical Flemish home, so this is what the inside of a merchant class person's home would look like in uh, Flanders, and you can see in the panel uh, the right panel with Joseph, uh, you can see the landscape, the cityscape of Flanders in the background. So we definitely know where we're located. This is very common. You're grounding a biblical story in your own home. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in most of the paintings we talk about. In this particular one, it's kind of general symbolism. So you have the book, the extinguished candle, the lilies, the copper basin in the corner, the towels, the fire screen, the bench. These are all symbols that are related to Mary and they're particularly related to Mary and her divine mission. In some of the other paintings, I'll go into a little more specifics with symbols, but basically you see these in Annunciation scenes a lot. Okay, in the right panel, we have Joseph, Joseph who was married to, uh, who marries Mary, right? Okay, if you know anything about the Bible, it's okay if you don't, I'll clue you in. So they get married, right? He's kind of Jesus's stepdad, okay? Okay. So uh, Joseph is over there, he's a carpenter, so he is making something in his tool shed. Well, what is he making? He's making mouse traps, which seems sort of odd, but the reason he's making mouse traps is because the mouse trap symbols the trap of the world in which Christ becomes the bait to trap the devil. That was the thought behind Joseph making mouse traps. Also, the specific tools that are uh, in the corner are actually mentioned in Isaiah. Um, saw and the rod. Uh, okay, so the patron and his wife are in, on the, the left panel, and I'm going to look at their names to make sure I get them right. It's Peter Engelbreck and Margaret Scrymaker are their names. Okay, so in this left panel we have a walled garden. 
Walled gardens are very commonly shown with Mary, the Virgin Mary, and also in the Annunciation. A walled garden is a symbol of her purity and her virginity, basically. And the flowers in this particular garden symbolize her virtue, um, particularly her humility. Okay, so our patrons, the people who bought the painting, are kneeling in the garden, witnessing this through the door, right? So we have um, Mr. Engelbrecht. Engelbrecht literally means angel bringer so he probably chose the subject matter because the angel bringer is gabriel the bringer of the news right um and then his wife's last name is scrymaker which literally means shrine maker or sometimes cabinet maker so you could also infer that the addition of joseph in the other panel who is making things um is maybe kind of a, a nod to her name and her heritage as well which is kind of interesting so there's lots of things like that when we look at these paintings but the other thing i want to talk about is just looking at the rich color the beautiful color that we see in this and the incredible amount of detail so when we get into the early renaissance here you see especially the northern renaissance painters you see this intense sharp focus detail you'll notice this in in several of the things that we look at today the reason that's interesting is because that's not really how things are, right? You don't see everything in total sharp focus like this. Things that are further away tend to be a little less focused. So that's what gives these sort of an unrealistic feel, is that it's, it's too encyclopedically detailed. It's too perfectly portrayed. With that in mind, let's talk about my favorite Northern European painter, Jan van Eyck. If you've heard of a Northern European painter, it's Jan van Eyck. He's the most famous guy. He's the superstar of his time and now. Um, he's done a lot of, of different famous works. He lives from 1395 to 1440-ish, 1441, I think. Uh, he's a very, very successful painter. He paints with oil paint. He does oil paint on wood, and he's very known for his encyclopedic detail. Uh, one of you is going to be assigned, um, to write about his Ghent altarpiece, which is one of his most famous works. This is another one of his most famous works that we're going to look at. So we'll learn about the Ghent altarpiece in our discussion th thread, which when whichever one of you I assign that to writes about it. Okay, so back to this painting. This is the painting of uh, Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. We don't know his wife's name because he had several wives, so we're not sure which one this is. There's a lot of theories about that. Um, Giovanni, first of all, when you see a G and an I next to each other in an Italian name, it's a J sound, so it's not Giovanni, it's Giovanni, Giovanni, okay? It's the Italian version of the word John. Uh, okay, so Giovanni Arnolfini. Gio Giovanni, uh, he works for the Medici's, the big bankers out of Florence, but he moves to Bruges. He's their guy in Bruges, basically. He's very wealthy. He's also a dealer in textiles and cloth, so he's a very, very wealthy banker and merchant type dude. Okay, so he wants this painting done. There's a lot of ideas about why. When I learned about this, I actually got to learn in front of the painting itself in the National Gallery in London um, from a really fantastic art historian. The popular theme idea at the time then was that this was a marriage portrait. Um, that is no longer what people think. Things change in art history. Um, more and more so as we get more information, but that still could be what it is. We're not really sure. So let's talk about this painting. Um, it was made in 1434. It is oil on wood panel. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, okay, we talked about who he is. So let's talk about some of the symbolism. There's lots of it. You see the little dog in the front? Okay, so little dogs like this uh, are often a symbol for fidelity. Um, if any of you have taken Latin, the uh, Latin word fidre, Fidre means to trust. What does Fidre kind of sound like? It kind of sounds like Fido, the sort of stereotypical dog name. That's not an accident. So this dog standing behind the, the married couple means fidelity and trust, is particularly trust in marriage. Okay. Uh, the finial on the bedpost, if you look at the back under the chandelier, you can see the the finial, the little carved ornament at the top of the bedpost. That is uh, St. Margaret. Why is it St. Margaret? Well, she's the patron saint of childbirth. Seems like something that you would want on your bed if you're a married couple and you're trying to have children, right? Uh, okay, so from the finial we have a uh, whisk broom, a, a little broom. That is a symbol of uh, domesticity. It's a symbol of um, kind of serving in your household as a woman. Um, we have the mirror. On the other side of the mirror we have prayer beads. Prayer beads are like 
religion in the household, keeping a good Christian household kind of thing. Um, we can also look at where they're standing. So she's standing further toward the interior, towards the bed. That's her domain, the um, interior of the house, the household. He's standing toward the open window. The outside world is his area. He's a merchant and a banker. So we're seeing some stuff about gender roles. His hand is raised in the symbol of authority. Her hand is um, outstretched toward him as a subservient kind of thing. He's looking at us, at the viewer. She's looking at him. Um, which shows her obedience to him. But in the court that they were part of at this time, she would actually be seen as his equal in a lot of ways. So you'll notice she's looking up into his eyes. She is not looking downcast. All of these things are significant. I know they sound sort of uh, silly, but it's all, everything is symbolic. Let's see. Uh, we have the uh, mirror. If you look at the mirror in the back, it's kind of incredible. You can see the back of the couple. You also see a witness in blue and you see a man wearing a red turban. The man wearing the red turban is Jan van Eyck, the artist. He's often, that's kind of his thing that he wore all the time. If you look at the scenes around the mirror, the decorative scenes around the mirror, it's the passion cycle of the Christ when Christ was being uh, crucified. Um, there are some theories that this portrait is actually done after the wife has died. And one of the things that contributes to that idea is that the death scenes from the Passion are on her side, the life scenes are on his side. If you look at the chandelier, a single candle is lit on his side. There's a little burnt out candle on her side. He goes on living, she's dead. The single candle also, also is often a symbol of the Holy Spirit, uh, which you want between you in your marriage, uh, in a Christian marriage, I guess. So that could also be symbolic of that. Uh, let's see, there's lots of things. Uh, oh, her dress is green. Green is a symbol of hope. This particular shade of green was very difficult to dye, so it would have been very expensive. It also makes a nod to his trade um, as a textile. One of his things was he was a textile guy. He was like a textile merchant, cloth merchant. Um, the way she's holding it is the style of the time. She's not pregnant in this painting, but this kind of holding it to her, um, like that is sort of to show fertility and a desire for children. Um, the shoes in the corner, or your shoes are off, your domestic, like basically that kind of thing. The red curtains on the bed are like passion and physical love. Um, the, there's cherries, it's a cherry tree outside particularly. Cherries are a symbol of love. The oranges on the windowsill, probably to symbolize the couple's wealth, because oranges would have been imported, imported at the time and very expensive. But sometimes they can mean fertility, sometimes they mean uh, fecundity in marriage, which is like your ability to have children to make babies, basically. Um, okay, so, but what we do know is the artist is the witness to whatever is happening. If we look under the chandelier and the detail shot, you can see his signature on the wall. It isn't just his signature, it says Jean van Eyck, Fui Hick, which means was here. So not only is he signing his name to the painting, he's also signing as a witness. So whatever's happening, whether it's their marriage, he was a witness to, it could have been that um, Giovanni was allowing, signing documents to allow his wife to continue his business while he is traveling. That was a ceremony that had to have a witness. Um, there, it could be any number of things, but whatever it is, the artist serves as more than just an artist. He's also a witness, which is pretty interesting at the time. Um, this was typical of his portraiture of the time, and he's one of the artists that helps make portraiture an a, a, um, important part of art, a, an important art form in the Northern Renaissance. Okay, Roger van der Weyden. Uh, Roger van der Weyden was an assistant to Robert Campen, who we talked about um, a couple slides ago. He became more famous than Campen, and he rivaled Jan van Eyck. He's kind of like the runner-up most famous dude at the time under van Eyck. Um, he's best known for recording the individual characteristics of subjects, so he did domestic portraiture of people too, and he was very good. Instead of, like, if we flip back here, how everyone kind of looks exactly like Putin a little bit <laughs> in Van Eyck, um, the way that Roger van der Weyden did portraiture, it was said that you could sort of feel the personality of the subjects. Um, let's see. This particular painting is not um, a portrait of uh, a patron, but it was most likely done for the Painters Guild in Brussels. Um, it honors the first Christian artist, which is 
uh, St. Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke by St. Luke, that guy. Um, we know it's St. Luke for a few reasons. Um, for one, if you look really closely on the right corner, kind of under the desk in the back there, you'll see an ox. The ox is uh, Luke's attribute, that's his symbol, so you know that this is Luke the Evangelist. Um, why else do we know it's Luke? Because he is the patron saint of artists, because the legend says, non-canonical texts say, that he painted Mary's portrait. Um, so this is clearly supposed to be Luke. We also think this is a self-portrait. We think Roger van der Weyden painted himself as Luke uh, in this portrait. Um, there's some other little interesting details and symbolism. If you look really close at the armrest of the chair, kind of if you draw a line to the edge of the painting from uh, baby Jesus's shoulder there, you'll see um, the chair armrest is carved. It's carved with Adam, Eve, and the serpent. So that's the fall of man, original sin. Um, according to biblical literature, um, Jesus and Mary are the redeemers of, of uh, mankind. So that's kind of a, showing that relationship um, in there. We see the landscape in the background um, of the city where it was commissioned. Um, so we see that there's a lot of layering going on in here. We see this sort of softness, but we also have this sharp encyclopedic detail. Again, if you look at everything, it's very detailed, very crisp, very precise. Okay, this is the last slide we're going to talk about for this first subsection. Uh, this, I love I love this. Um, this is uh, Martin Schongauer. Martin Schongauer uh, was a painter, but he's most famous as a printmaker, particularly as an engraver. His dad was a goldsmith, so he was around um, metal, people working with metal his whole life. That was part of his upbringing, which you can kind of, maybe that led to his development as an engraver. Um, he's the most skilled Northern European master of metal engraving of his time. He's, he kind of invented the technique of cross hatching rather than parallel hatching, which is when you make, you make your lines and then you make lines over them um, at an intersection to show value and texture. He's kind of the, the front runner pioneer of that technique. Uh, you can see all the distinctions he's able to achieve in the tonal value in each of these shapes and also all the different textures. Um, for engraving, so engraving is a printmaking technique. Lines are incised or um, are cut into a metal plate, uh, generally a copper plate. Um, so it's the opposite of relief printing where you build something up and then cut away the background. In this, you're cutting the actual lines that you'll be printing in. Then the ink goes down into those lines and when you print on it, it transfers the ink from the lines you've incised. So that's how, um, it's the opposite of intaglio, basically. Um, Okay, so this piece is uh, St. Anthony Tormented by Demons. It's from around 1480. Um, I picked this one because I just love it. I, I mean, I just think it's very uh, cool if you look at these demons are so wacky looking. Like you can see all these really bizarre characters that he's making. And in 1480, it just seems like there's, I mean, they're demonic, sure, but they're also kind of hilarious. Like they look a little Dr. Seussy. Um, but his mastery of technique is unparalleled at the time, and he's quite an important um, artist for us to look at. Okay, so that is our first subsection of our Renaissance and Baroque um, module. So there will be a lecture like this and a slideshow for each subsection, and then of course you have your discussion posts. All right, I'll see you again soon, guys. Bye.